So this stunningly beautiful object you can see in front of me is the newest Aston Martin. This is the DB12. And as you can see from the missing roof section, this is the Volante, Italian for flying, and the name that Aston Martin has put on all of its sporty convertibles ever since 1965. This is then the latest in a very long and glorious line. Now I say new, there is some familiar stuff under here. This bodywork is obviously new. Um, it's incredibly good looking. But look at that gaping mouth down here to feed air into that powerful engine. We'll talk more about that in a second. But actually underneath, there's some familiar bits from the old DB11. In some ways, you can think of this as a major facelift of the old DB11. By the way, if you can hear some weird noises in the background, it's because of our location in the Oxfordshire countryside, there's weird mood music being piped through. Don't ask me why. Underneath here then, is much of the same platform from the old DB11. So you get extruded aluminium sections that are then riveted and bonded together to form a very light, very strong, very stiff structure. If that roof actually is quite clever. Aston Martin says it folds away here at a height of just 260 millimeters when it's all packed in. Uh, and that is in theory, more compact than that of any comparable rival. But it's an Aston Martin, so it lives and dies on its engine. Now, although this is called DB12, doesn't get a 12, it actually gets a V8, not a V12 like the old DB11 had. This is actually the same four litre twin turbo V8 that you'll find under the bonnet of many Mercedes AMG models, Mercedes and Aston Martin, having been partners for many years now. Now, it's a bit churlish to complain about losing four cylinders when you do get a massive 680 horsepower and zero to 100 kilometers an hour coming up in just 3.7 seconds. This is a serious performance car, but you do wonder, will people being asked to shell out as much much money as this car will cost, worry about the loss of the old 12-cylinder engine. What they won't worry about is the interior because this is a big, big improvement on what the DB11 used to be like. The DB11 was quite cheap and plasticky inside. This is not. You get beautiful leather work everywhere. You get a very good new touch screen and you still get some proper physical buttons. Thankfully, Aston Martin hasn't forgotten that you still need to use some of the controls when you're driving. Speaking of driving, being as the rain is just about holding off and the roof is down, I think it's about high time we went out and did some of that. So now that we're actually out and about in the DB12 Volante, and I have put the roof up just a few minutes ago, um, partially to try it out, but also so that it's quieter in here so that I can talk and be heard. Um, yeah, some of you may regret that decision. It, what is the DB12 Volante actually like? I mean, is it a terrible surprise to hear that it's really, really rather good? Um, I think one of the most impressive things about it is that um, it, despite cutting the roof off, Aston Martin has said that it hasn't had to add any extra bracing material underneath the structure to retain the stiffness, even though the roof has gone. So clearly that, that bonded aluminium chassis that's under here is really something else because it is maintaining the same levels or similar levels at any rate of stiffness as the DB12 Coupe. All that's changed really, uh, aside from the 90 kilogram weight penalty of having the convertible roof, uh, is that the rear suspension rates have been altered. Um, everything else, uh, a couple of small tweaks here and there, otherwise it remains the same as the Coupe. Now, remaining the same as the Coupe obviously means you get that V8 twin turbo Mercedes AMG derived uh, engine which sits so far back in the chassis, it's, it's effectively a mid-engine car, even though it's technically front-engined. The engine sits almost here under the dashboard. It's, it's that far back in the, in the body. Uh, and that makes this quite an interesting car to drive because you'll be expecting a big front-engine 2 plus 2 grand touring coupe such as this to be rather ponderous um, and, and, and in some ways difficult to drive on quite tight and twisty country roads that we're on today. And it just isn't. Um, the steering is, is quite chatty, good, good weight, full of feel, full of feedback. Um, and that nose, that big long nose with that huge gaping shark's mouth, it just flicks into corners without a care in the world. So much front end grip, um, so much rear end traction come to that. It is really, really well set up this car. Um, it's also comfortable. Now, there's three stages of damping control for the adaptive dampers. The best thing to do is probably have everything else turned over to sport mode, but have the dampers set in comfort. And then you get a fantastic combination of sort of tight body control and sharper steering, but you, you get that underlying soft ride that makes it, makes it not only more comfortable, but keeps the car better balanced on give and take roads such as these. 
Now that four litre engine with its twin turbos, it's surprisingly refined most of the time. Um, actually, it's almost discreet, I think you'd call it. You can adjust the levels of loudness coming from the exhaust with a button here on this dramatic sweeping center console. Um, but really, it only gets loud when you absolutely uncork all the power, like this. And then it gets properly loud. Um, and then the thunder just really, really, really kicks in, which is quite something. And performance really is quite something. That 3.7 second, zero to 100 kilometer an hour time is completely believable. This is a staggeringly rapid car. Is it a supercar though? Aston is kind of trying to claim that it is because it calls this DB12 a super tourer. So it's theoretically supercar performance, but with Grand Tourer comfort and refinement. And yeah, you can kind of see that. It, it's not just a bit of uh, marketing puffery. That's kind of how this car feels. I think ultimately it really is a big GT. It's the kind of car you get in and you just cover vast mileages in one big gulp. Uh, and you don't feel the pain of it because it is quite a refined and quite a comfortable car. This interior, there's some beautiful finishing going on here. I love this center, this center console with its tactile rotary switches and, and the, big, uh, the big controller here for the driving mode and the engine stop start. That's really good. The new screen is good. Um, I'm not so keen on the digital instrument panel. I don't think that looks grand enough for a car like this, for an Aston Martin, certainly one that costs this much money. It's quite a plain and simple interior. It's not dramatically styled in any sense. And I have to say that's kind of growing on me. You might expect a bit more theater for the money involved in this car, but actually I quite like the relatively understated look of it. And the front seats are absolutely fantastic. This is a, a really superbly comfortable car. I do like that indeed. I mean, is it gonna be worth the money? Uh, you know, you're talking, it's gonna be half a million quid this car, isn't it? Um, I don't know if it's worth that but it is pretty lovely. I mean, with that long nose pointing down a stretch of favorite road with that V8 engine thundering away and pushing you on and that gorgeous bodywork enveloping you, it's a kind of a pretty hard car not to fall in love with just a little bit.